and I'm here today. Let me do that again, because I think we might have just started. I'm Jim Rainey from the Politics Now blog at the LA Times. I'm here with Michael Hiltzik today, and as many of you out there probably already know, Mitt Romney has gotten himself into a bit of hot water over the last 24 hours or so when he came out and said that roughly half of the American population uh, like to consider themselves victims, they like to be dependent, uh, they rely on government uh, services, which he, he sort of suggested they don't really pay for. And this has created quite a furor. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today with Mike Helsick, who's our uh, uh, financial affairs columnist here at the Times. So Mike, I thought maybe first you could just lay out for us. Mitt Romney's suggesting that half the of America pays taxes, the other half doesn't. Uh, I have a feeling maybe you don't think that's quite accurate. Why don't you lay out what, what's really going on in terms of tax liability for Americans? Uh, sure. Well, uh uh, Mitt, I think, has done something that conservatives have been doing for a long time, which is slice the baloney on this theme pretty carefully and pretty thin. Uh, essentially, what he says is that 47% uh, of Americans don't pay income taxes, and what he means by that clearly are federal income taxes. And as I uh, write in my column that will appear tomorrow, that's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't really go very far, and it certainly doesn't walk the last mile. Because what it overlooks is, it overlooks a lot of things. Number one, that four-fifths of Americans pay more in payroll taxes than they pay in income taxes. And that includes about half of all the people who pay no federal income taxes. So these are people who are working. Uh, they're paying Social Security taxes. They're paying Medicare taxes. Uh, they're, they're contributing to their own retirement. They're contributing to society. Um, a lot of the others are temporarily paying no federal income taxes. It would have been somewhat more accurate for Romney to have said 47% of, of these Americans aren't paying federal income taxes now. And that's because a lot of the people in this group are people who've, who've come out of the income tax paying group just because of the economic recession and are likely to be back in the income tax paying group within a year or two. Uh, these are people who've, who've lost their jobs or who've benefited from tax breaks on unemployment insurance uh, or, or who have lost enough income so that their exemptions and their deductions and other tax benefits uh, actually exceed what they owe in taxes, but uh, right. a lot of right. them are the working poor or, right. or the unemployed. Um, just right. a couple of years ago, in 2007, before the economic crash, this number would have been less than 40 percent. Today it's 47, but a year or two ago it was actually over 50 percent, and that was because of all the, the economic uh, assistance programs that were put in by the Obama administration right. and, have, and have, right. have expired. So it's, a, it's actually a shrinking group. Right, right. And one thing we've heard from some of the critics of, of uh, Governor Romney today is that in effectively in his 2010 taxes, the only taxes he's released, I believe is his effective tax rate, Mike, was something in the 13 percent range. And that for people who are having payroll deductions for Medicare uh, and Social Security, that's 15 point something, 15.3. I believe. That's, that's right. And certainly if you include the employer's share, which is legitimate uh, economically uh, the right way to count that. Uh, that's absolutely true. In fact, if you earn $100,000 or less, you owe more in payroll tax on the average than you do in, in income tax. That's the crossover right. point. Right. So it's been interesting on the political side today. Na naturally, we'd expect the Democrats are on all-out attack mode on this, and you can see why. Um, the Republicans have a have a bit of a divide. You've got people like uh, David Frum, David Brooks of the of the uh, New York Times, William Crystal, all coming out and essentially saying Mitt screwed up and he needs to kind of make this right in one way or another. On the other side, you've got the Rush Limbaugh's of the world and I'd say the more sort of die hard uh, right wing saying, no, absolutely, we believe this stuff. It has a bit of the flavor of the Ayn Rand uh, philosophy that we heard from Paul Ryan earlier that's saying, let's completely own this. There's a, there's a user class and there's a uh, or a creator class and a taker class, and the takers are this 47%. So let's just go ahead and and completely uh, buy into this thing. But Mike, let's let's turn and talk a little bit now. So that's the the tax. Uh, those are the people, or how much is paid? 
what kinds of people are in this 47%? Now, the, the, the impression we might get is that they're all sort of welfare uh, queens, so to speak, but who, who's in that 47%, some of whom aren't paying taxes? Sure, that's that's the other great canard, and uh, maybe a, a greater uh, canard or, or, or a greater misstatement that's implicit in, in the conclusions that Romney drew for his donors at this this videotape fundraising uh, speech. Uh, he, he made the leap from saying that there are 47% of Americans who pay no income tax to saying that this is a dependent class, that these are people who he, he's given up convincing to take responsibility for their lives. But if you really break it down, what you find is that a huge percentage of them are uh, elderly. These are people who are retired. They're, they're not paying taxes because they're living on Social Security and Medicare, which is not taxed at, at the full And presumably, Mike, if I can interject, they did pay when they were working people they paid, before they retired. They paid all their lives for these benefits. They right, contributed right. to society. Oh, okay. they, they really they shouldered their, their burden. Uh, their feet are tired because they walked uh, the whole way. Uh, a lot of them are students who are preparing to enter the workforce, who are preparing to enter the taxpaying class, uh, and they get ed education credit. Some of them are uh, the disabled, and as, I, and as I pointed out, a number of them are the unemployed, who, who are not sitting around. They, you know, there's, there's a myth there that they're happy being unemployed. Uh, I, I don't think anybody who knows many people who've lost their jobs uh, is, that, is under that that misimpression. Maybe Mr. Romney is, but then he's not really paying attention to uh, uh, to the people who was president. He would he would really have to serve. Right, right. So as I said before, uh, naturally there's criticism coming from liberals on this, but, you know, William Crystal, no, no liberal he, uh, called these remarks stupid and arrogant. Um, you had uh, David Brooks saying that it suggested that, that Mr. Romney didn't really understand the people of America, the culture of America, or he said words to the effect of Brooks did. He doesn't seem to understand the country that he lives in. So, so really taking a beating from from people who you wouldn't expect, although they've been a little bit critical before. They really let him have it today. Well, well, let's. I, I think you can even go further, and you can say that that it doesn't sound as if Romney really understands the role of government. And there are two points that I would make here. First of all, this is an old trope, and it. it it's what I've written about before, in fact, almost exactly a year ago. This is the myth of the undeserving poor, and it's it's based on this notion. Uh, it's a conservative notion. It may even be a fringe conservative notion, but it's li alive today, which is that if you're poor and you need assistance, it's because it, there's some sort of moral uh, uh, moral problem in your makeup that you don't really deserve this sort of assistance. It's, it's, when Romney says he can't convince people, these people, to take responsibility, that's what he's saying. He's saying they don't deserve our help; they're just there to take. Um, so, so, so I think that's that's really important. And the other thing is that uh, you know the tradition that that we've gr all grown up with in the United States really dates back to the New Deal, to the Depression, when we had the consequences of imprudent fiscal policy I in front of us. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who you know, who of course really remade American government in terms of its service to the American people, was very clear that he saw the role of government in times like this exactly to be to put food on the table for people who couldn't do it any other way, to make sure that all Americans had a roof over their heads, access to education, the opportunity uh, for life, and protection against people in the community who were out to take advantage of them. Right. And it really, when, when Romney talks this way, and whether he really believes this or misunderstands or is just pandering to his audience, he's really suggesting that he doesn't understand. He has a very different conception of what government is supposed to do, that, that it's, it's, it's there for limited purposes, it's there to get out of the way of people who might take advantage of their fellow human beings, uh, and that it's certainly not there to make sure that all Americans have food on the table and a roof over their heads. This is a really different view of, Amer of government's responsibility, and it's, it's one that I think is at odds with the America that we all grew up with, and indeed our parents all grew up with. 
Right, right. And I think actually Mitt Romney, if people watched him today and last night he was on with Neil Cavuto of Fox Today, he didn't at all retreat from these comments. He said he was inartful or something, but he's really embracing them, which is much uh, being cheered, again, by the Rush Limbaugh's and some of the people on the right in the party. Um, let's take a look the, back four years. We had another incident, not totally dissimilar to this, at least in the, in, in the way that it started, which was Barack Obama at a fundraiser in San Francisco speaking to a bunch of of wealthy donors and he said his what became sort of an infamous comment he said that the disaffected poor in particular in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania these sort of what have been known previously as Reagan Democrats that these people because of their economic dislocation that they become bitter and when they become bitter they turn to guns and religion and they, and they turn against people unlike them. Um, this created a huge furor. I was just looking back at the clips from four years ago. This went on for months, and particularly Hillary Clinton uh, was beating the living stuffing out of Obama on this point, and it seemed to be getting some traction in the polls, and yet we all know the, the end result, which was Obama survived that. He, he managed to win out in the primaries and through the caucuses. And so to me, I mean, I know people are making the comparison. Certainly, I know some of the Republicans are bringing up that incident. I think there are a few major differences. One is that the group that he talked about, and whether you, let's just assume that you thought he was absolutely wrong in his comments, which people will debate, he was referring really to a smaller group of Americans, although maybe an important one in, in electoral terms. The other thing was he made those remarks, I believe in April, April 10th or 11th, and he had months and months and months to be in front of the American people and convince them, well, I may have said that he both said he was inartful, as Romney has, and he also gave more of a mea culpa. So I, I think the comparison, there are probably other major differences between the two, but my take is that he had a much easier time recovering, although even if then it was a bit of a struggle. I don't think it's this is going to be that easy for Romney with about 49 days left. Mike, Mike what do you think of that? Well, I, I don't think Romney has shown that that he's got the lifestyle uh, or the, the speaking style to recover from something like this. Uh, right. But I think there, there's another point that I would make, which is that there's a, if you really drill down, there's a fundamental distinction between the point that Obama was trying to make and the point that Romney is trying to make. And it's the difference between trying to be inclusive and basically being exclusionary. Uh, Romney is essentially saying, this is the way these people are, and it's there's no point in making an appeal to them because they're not going to respond. They're just out to get to get and to take. Uh, Obama, I think, was striving to be empathetic with these people. He was really trying to understand why they were reacting to, uh, to their situation, but he was recognizing that they had, in a sense, a legitimate grievance, that they had been kicked to the, to the side of the road by, uh, by society and by economic reality, and they were reacting because they didn't have any other resources to, uh, they didn't have any other ideas. And I, I think when you really drill down, and yes, sure, it was inelegant, it was an artful, call it what you will, he was basically saying that these are people we need to find a way to appeal to. Romney mm -hmm. is saying something very, very different. He's saying these are people who we're not going to be able to appeal to. So we, so he was saying to his donors, you have to help me by contributing all your money to appeal to everybody else because that's the only way we're going to win. Right. And in fact, when he came back today, Romney did say quite clearly, he repeated it, that, you know, each, both he and Obama have roughly 47 percent. He may be a little generous to himself there because he's fallen behind by a few points, it appears, in the polls, but that they both are fighting for the five to seven or eight percent in the middle. And so uh, he did all but it sounds like give up on 47 percent of the electorate that i guess that's something you can say usually in private with your uh, campaign consultants it's not typically done out in the open uh, especially when well, there's a microphone presence so and it's, I, it's not all that wise to assume that anything you say in private will be in private because as right. we now know what happens in boca raton doesn't stay in boca raton at least it, <laughs> It, it didn't happen in this case. Right. It certainly didn't in this case. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. So that was Michael Hiltzik, who's the uh, fine, fine business columnist for the LA Times. You can read his column in tomorrow's LA Times, also on Sundays. You can follow him on Twitter, at Michael Hiltzik. And I'm Jim Rainey. You can follow me uh, at LA Times Rainey on Twitter. And also read my stuff at uh, latimes.com backslash politics. So uh, thanks for joining us.